Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the ChrisVossShow.com. The ChrisVossShow.com. Hey, we're coming to here with another podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. We've been hitting new records on people downloading the podcast, so we are just wonderfully appreciative of the best audience that we have. We have the best audience ever. You guys are the best, least. So many. Um, and we have the greatest hosts and, of course, guests as well. Mostly guests, really, when it comes down to it. Uh, so uh, we've got another wonderful podcast for you today here we'll share. Be sure to tell your friends, neighbors, relatives, dogs, cats, mistresses, pool boys. Get them all downloading and listening to the Chris Voss Show podcast. Go to Google Play or iTunes, and you can check out the podcast there. Or you can go to YouTube.com, for slash Chris Voss, hit that bell notification button as well, so you get all the notifications of what we're doing. I have a wonderful guest on today. Of course, we have all the best guests. Um I, I don't have any good sort of uh, presidential uh, impression. Uh, Kevin Hong. Kevin is the best-selling author of The Outlier Approach. You can get it on Amazon. How to triumph your career, in your career, as a non-conformist. Previously, Kevin grew his startup, DealFlix, up to a $15 million valuation. He's currently an advisor to several startups, including Cinemia and a competitor, of movie pass with it and several executives that he consults with i'm sure as well uh so welcome to the show kevin how are you good how are good, you good, good good so we can get your book uh on amazon the outlier approach how to triumph in your career as a non-conformist uh tell us about you and let's get to know you better yeah um so i have a pretty heavy background in sales um as a matter of fact after i moved back uh, to the states at the age of 16 from korea um it's i know it's almost impossible to imagine now but i spoke really choppy english and my first job was actually um, network marketing so one of those things where you have to sign up your friend and i guess like the unofficial name for those types of businesses i think they call it a pyramid scam and despite having horrible english i signed up all my dorm mates all my schoolmates um i was starting to make something like ten thousand dollars a month wow um, and then I realized, well, maybe I should uh, be an entrepreneur. So I ended up um, dropping out. And this obviously upset my uh, Asian parents who, you know, and, and I, I kind of explained in my book, they came to America for an American education. And I wanted to kind of pursue the American dream. And because it upset them so much, after making $10,000 a month for about three months, I go back to school um, and then somehow stumbled upon poker. And that gave me an interest in finance. You went from MLMs to gambling with poker. Yeah, I was like, maybe maybe I could read people. And I, I did okay. I played some tournaments, made made a couple thousand, and then um, tried to move up uh, to high stakes. Lost it all at Commerce Casino. Commerce Casino. I know some of your uh, poker lover uh, listeners might might be familiar. They play a lot of big tournaments over there. Uh, yeah. um, so I ended up driving to LA that same night, for, um, trying to make some money at Circus Circus in Las Vegas. And then lost another uh, couple thousand <laughs> one night. And Wait, then you I, lost money casino? No one, no, that doesn't happen to anyone. I live here yeah. in Vegas. They win all the time. Of course, right? Right? It's it's all with the slot machines. Um, so that's when I really finally like picked up a book for the first time. Uh, fell in love with finance. Realized, you know, there's some similarities between poker and trading and whatnot. So uh, my first gig was actually at like a corporate gig was actually becoming a uh, stockbroker uh, for E-Trade during the Great Recession. So this was really intense. Yeah. Where People are getting laid off. Um, you know, my first few clients that called me on the phone, they're literally crying because uh, they were invested in Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, you know, oh, Fannie Freddie. Oh, you name it. Geez. So I'm trying to place these trades and it's really intense. It's just going back and forth and everyone's selling. You got to make sure you're not buying something that you're supposed to sell. Uh, you add an extra zero by mistake. They're going to ax you because, you know, the, some of these trades were, you know, a quarter million, half a million for me. Yeah. Um, and some adults, two or three times my age, were just literally crying on the phone, and and that's, you know, it was it was really scary back then, but it actually really helped me become a great entrepreneur. So I realized money can come and go so quickly. Yeah. And, um, in between, um, I guess I tried to launch a hedge fund with a client that didn't work out. Um, coincidentally, we tried to launch it in Fort Lauderdale, ninety miles away from uh, where Madoff happened, basically. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, that, that didn't work out. So I moved back home. I'm um, kind of like a puppy with his tail between his legs to, you know, back to my parents' house, uh, saved some money, uh, did some trading, um, worked out, you know, okay. 
And then uh, I launched DealFlix. And I never forgot the lessons I learned um, being a trader. Um, and I was so scared of uh, losing it all. You know, I literally lived in a van uh, for two years trying to meet every single client um, across the country. So uh, DealFlix is a movie ticketing app. It was kind of like a Groupon, but for movie deals. Hmm. And in order to become really efficient, I realized, we realized we, have, we had to meet our clients face to face. Um, and, you know, we did that. We grew it um, to about 750 locations, wow. uh, $7 million a year, annual uh, revenue run rate. And then... Um, the funny thing is, I, I kind of go into detail in this book. Um, the partner I partnered up with, um, I'm not going to say his name on the show. You can find out in the book, though. Um, he ends up firing me. And, you know, what was interesting about that experience was that my partner, he continued on to be part of the network marketing business for about 10 years, mm -hmm. even after I had left. So as the company grew, um, you know, I, I definitely believe that we needed more uh, management leadership. And, and the oldest, oldest guy on the team was like 31, 32, and, which was my business partner at that time. I'm a couple of years younger than him. And, um, you know, we tried, we tried everything to kind of smooth out our partnership. I kind of, you know, pointed out some of the ways he can improve. And uh, he took it as, as a personal attack. We even did marriage counseling to try to resolve the partnership. Uh, but once I, it was horrible. It was horrible. Um, because it was a performance issue and, and he took everything so personally. Wow. Um, so when, when I escalated to investors, um, you know, investors pretty much agreed, Hey, marriage counseling is not going to work. Uh, you guys need some advisors on the board and whatnot. And, um, he didn't like that. He saw it as a personal betrayal. Um, so I ended up getting axed, uh, from my own startup after living in a van for a couple of years. Wow. But the cool thing is, you know, we had a ton of media coverage at this time for, for the innovative or. I guess more like super lean startup way of building a business. So we were on CNBC at New York Times, LA Times, um, even in Ch uh, China's Xinhua News and um, Korea Korea Times and, uh, and a couple of European newspapers and whatnot. So um, when I when I got axed from my own company, um, I that naturally segued into a position as the chief sales officer uh, for a company called Cinema, Intel Cinema Intelligence, which was a subsidiary of a publicly traded company. Uh, called the Vista Group, and they're pretty big in the movie space. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was pretty angry about the situation, but then I had all this pent-up energy, and I talked to about 10 lawyers. They said, hey, you're, you're wrongfully terminated. You could probably go after your old firm. Um, but as, at the, as the second largest shareholder, you know, it's kind of like shooting yourself in the foot when you do that. So I, I just kind of use that energy um, to write my book. Um, I share my story about, you know, network marketing as an 18 year old, uh, despite having limited English, my failed hedge fund attempt, um, living in a van to grow the business. And I interviewed some fascinating people. Like, um, one of the people that I interviewed that was really fun was, um, size manager that teamed up with Justin Bieber's manager, uh, to bring Gangnam style into the U S and how that deal actually happened. That was uh, a hell of a deal. That was a hell of a, yeah, that was, that was really fun getting all the, uh, inner people in the inner circle. Luckily I we was have you to blame for that video. What's that? We have you to blame for that video. Oh no. Well, you know what you have, you have uh, Q, the guy who hooked it up. Like originally, uh, when Scooter Brown, Justin Bieber's manager saw the video, he called Q up who was in Korea at that time. Cause he was one, um, working for Sony pictures and he says, Hey, I want to buy the rights. So Justin Bieber, could do the horse dance and I'm going to do a parody remix. So that's, that's how the conversation started. And at wow. that time, there was never an Asian pop star from Asia that actually made, you know, such a wave. So Scooter Brown, just like how he took a risk on uh, Justin Bieber at that time, because Justin Bieber was originally a YouTube star. Yeah. Um, he decided to bring Cy in and he was like, Hey, let's give it, you know, let's try it, try it out. And then um, that really, you know, propelled that, video to the next level and for five years it was the highest viewed uh youtube video yeah, that thing was that thing was, insane. That was big, right yeah yeah just so like it much. was the way the deal was done was just really out of the box thinking um you know in my book i talk about living outside the box instead of thinking outside the box um there's a concept i introduced called social arbitrage um you know the art of creating something when you have nothing to offer uh, we'll, we'll get more into that in, in detail um, I also had a chance to interview uh, Kevin Johnson, CEO of Udemy, as well as uh, ex-NBA basketball player John Sammons. Um, I mean, there's a whole slew of really exciting executives who use um, really interesting strategies and unorthodox ways to to kind of get to where they are where where they are today. So um, that's the basis of the book. Um, it's, it's really for the nonconformist 
or, or you know, like the rebels or the oddballs, you know, um, people who are willing to live in a van, live in a van, that type of stuff. <laughs> we all live in a van someday. Uh, <laughs> we're all gonna be at this pace. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> so so I mean, being a nonconformist, did you did you have one of those Asian tiger mom or tiger parents? Oh, it was the worst. <laughs> so check this out. So I am. In, in East Asian culture. I'm sure your mom's a wonderful person, but. Oh, she's a wonderful person. But um, so <laughs> I had one of those, um, you know, I was, I'm the first son for four. Oh, the first son. That makes it worse. I was the first son. Four, four generations, right? Yeah, you, you, you carry the, uh, you carry the flame forthward as the first child, man. They, yeah. they, they lower the boom on the first child. <laughs> And, and, and my dad, um, he went to Seoul University, which was the equivalent of uh, Harvard. Oh, wow. Um, my, my grandpa, um, when, when the Japanese took over Korea, they took him to study at Waseda University, which is like, you know, the, the, the Yale of Japan. Mm. Um, and my, that was my great grandpa, actually. And my grandpa went to kind of like the Yale of uh, Korea. Um, so I have this like pedigreed family of academia. And- wow. Growing up, I you know I lived in Minnesota very briefly um, as a kid from two to nine. Mm -hmm. um, so when we moved back to Korea at the age of nine, you know instead of playing little league and you know fishing and stuff like that, I'm taking piano lessons. I'm taking art classes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to school six days a week because back then you had to go to school Saturday. Um, so I started running away from home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you get a tiger mom. Yeah, so I, I, I I'm all I'm the ultimate non Asian guy in a way. Um You're the black and, sheep of the lineage of 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 kids, families, parents, whatever. Yeah, and so what's so funny, <laughs> so that's why I chose the black duck, because you know, a duck can swim, it can fly, it could um it could um walk, but you know, you're not really good at a lot of things, but you turn into a swan, um, that type of theme going on on, on the book cover. Um, so there were a couple incidents where I literally slept um, on, on the subway, like kind of like pursuit of happiness or the apartment stairs because I refused to study. So um, my parents, when they when they, you know, when they saw me, you know, heard about me live in a van, they weren't as worried um, because it's better to have, you know, like an adult live in a van than, you know, when when he's he's just a kid at like 13 living on uh, in the subway. So they weren't as as worried. But um it was a it was a rough childhood because there was just so much emphasis on education, and I I was never super excited about education because you know my dad studied till he was forty because to get his PhD and whatnot. So wow. we had a lot of student debt. Uh, where my parents was like looking at all the books back here. Yeah, I'm actually on a business trip um, in LA, so I'm leaving Chicago right now. So I'm actually at my parents' house, and these are all his books. So when mom sounds, like, to get sounds like you needed. Uh, Sounds like you needed one of those Chris Farley SNL characters. You're going to live in a van down by the river. Oh, <laughs> I've been hearing that for years. Yeah, I think I heard exactly. That's me. That's me. And um, yeah, it was funny when mom, mom and dad used to get into a fight. The first thing my mom would attack was my dad's books. She'll start oh. throwing them away. You know. <laughs> and so, I know how PhD people are. They're really anal about their education. They should be. They spent half their life in college. Mm -hmm. So. But yeah, I, wow, that that must have been fun. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was rough being so different. And um, <laughs> even up to about two or three years, my my parents were like, with all the effort that you put into deal flicks and you know selling, you know outdated phone services, doing your network marketing business, you could have gotten two PhDs. Like, what are you doing with your life? So it's <laughs> brutal. They That's just brutal. They just, you know, they just don't, you know, it's really hard for them to understand. And I'm not sure if you know, um, Asians tend to like to compete against other Asians, particularly mm -hmm. from the same country. Um, so when I was on CNBC, my mom didn't care. When I was on the New York Times, I didn't care. And then I was on the local Korea Times newspaper and I was, you know, in the restroom. My mom starts banging on the door. She's like, you're famous. Koreans know you. I'm like, mom, I've been I've been on the news for a year for this uh, deal flick thing. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> Because you would just want to brag to other Korean moms. Well, the neighbors, um, the neighbors on the street don't watch CNBC. They watch that local news. So yeah, you know, exactly. You gotta, you gotta, so so at that point, were you? Did you did you get some redemption? I guess at that point. Yes. So the the biggest surprise um, of my book was my parents finally understanding me. 
So, so my parents, um, you know, my mom was such a tiger mom. I, I barely had a relationship with her um, until after college. Um, it was like having a drill sergeant, um, you know. And, and my, my <laughs> they are like drill sergeants. They're tough. Yeah. Yes. I, sometimes I wonder if I would have been better off with an Asian mom because she would have kicked my ass and I, I needed it. <laughs> well, you could have turned out like me, you know, just. I probably would have because I did. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. The extreme opposite. Um, so, you know, my parents and I, we had this kind of on and off relationship uh, for, um, you know, my adult life. But once they read the book, they finally understood, oh, OK, this is, you know, he's just a product of his environment. Um, and they, they finally understood why I was wired they, the way I was. So it, it just became a real good um, healing process. And, you know, for the first time in my life, I think, you know, last year when they started reading the manuscript, they, they finally supported everything I do. Like, they're so proud. They're like the biggest. And it, it never it never happens like that. Like, you know, Asian parents are like, you know, you you um, you know, you get a B plus and then it's like yeah. an F, you know, yeah, tell to pay if you get an A minus, man. Yeah. You get it. You go to UC Berkeley. They're not. Why not Stanford? You know. You go to. Uh, you know. Columbia. Why not Harvard? Um, <laughs> you know. It's just never good enough. You know that kind of stuff. Um, it's tough. It's tough. I mean. I mean. I think. I. I don't know how pervasive this is in the Korean culture, but I had a friend whose girlfriend was Korean, and you know she talked about the one thing you can never do is embarrass the family. That's like. That's like the death penalty right there. Embarrassing the family. Yeah, shame, dignity, um, big deal. And and you yeah. have to understand, um, you know, Koreans don't have a very um, entrepreneurial. Like I actually talk about this in my book. Um, we got hit pretty bad with the IMF crisis back in the late nineties. Um, mm -hmm. You guys remember the Asian contagion? Um, so that was my childhood. Um, you know, the, the 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 foundation of my childhood was going through that um, IMF crisis. And Korea's GDP dropped by 33%. Like, can you? Yeah. I remember, uh, well, I think it was a lot of, I remember Japan's where Japan pretty much went to a, a, a zero uh, Fed rate and almost had to go, I think they went negative at one point to just, they were paying people to borrow money from them. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. So when, when you know, like, I think they say when America sneezes, sneezes uh, the whole world catches a cold. Yeah. Um, and that's how it was in Korea. And and I was one of those uh, immigrants where, you know, they said that, hey, you know, we want all our kids to be a doctor or a lawyer only for sure. It reconfirmed what Asian culture was about after the Asian IMF crisis. So there were a wave of immigrants um, wow. left in the early 2000s from Asia uh, pursuing um, American education. So I'm actually a byproduct of that. So I actually had to dig up and do some research on this uh, mm -hmm. as I was writing my book. It's actually pretty fascinating stuff. I actually caught the Asian contagion one time. It was on a uh, John I did, the Thailand and the red light district, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> That's great. My mom wants me to catch the Asian contagion. Yeah, I don't, don't tell your mom. I <laughs> Uh, so no, I grew up, uh, I myself, like you grew up in a very restricted environment. Mine was religiously restricted, um, very cultish, very, very, um, contained and controlled mind washing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my parents are good people. They, they meant well. And I think they thought if they raised kids in this environment, maybe they'd turn it into something, uh, really good, which, which my other siblings actually did, but I did not. <laughs> Um, much to their chagrin. Um, and I, I also turned into a nonconformist, uh, uh, thing. I pretty much blew out of their, out of the, uh, out of the containing walls they put me in. Uh, and I, of course, uh, at a very early age, I think three knew that, uh, the cult and religion was, was bogus. Um, and, uh, then, I, then I officially left, I think when I was 16, but my parents espoused to me the same sort of controls and, and they were a bit nicer on my grades, um, but uh, uh, it, you know they wanted me to grow up, serve religion, serve a mission for the cult, um, and um, you know get, get married in the temple and do all the cult things that I was supposed to for the rest of my life. And the fact that I didn't at sixteen and went off on my own, they uh, they weren't really happy with that, and they weren't for about twenty years. <laughs> wow, that's a long time. Yeah, it, uh, you know, there was uh, a lot of years we didn't talk to each other because, uh, you know, it, it would, you couldn't have a conversation without the cult coming up. 
and and then you know the pushing uh which i'm sure you're familiar with with having a tiger mom yeah. where you know they start pushing the agenda on you of yeah how you should be and represent the family and then when i became successful and started my businesses um i was like one of the first people who's really successful in my in my um uh, uh in my family and so it was really weird like you have a set of five ducks on your cover your book the outlier approach on amazon uh and one uh the ducks in the middle is black which you made a reference to earlier you know made a reference to the black duck and so what was funny was i became the black sheep in my family but i also became the golden child at the same time so there'd be these conversations like we want to bring you to the family event the family get together uh, because we want to, you know, show you off and tell them how all the success you've had, but we can't have you like talk about you're not you're not in the cult and uh, you can't swear and you can't you can't wear your sh you can't wear your shorts that you always wear and you got to dress up. And I'm like, so I'm the black sheep of the family, but I'm the golden child. That everyone wants to show off. How messed up is this? So you and I have kind of been through this similar experience with this. I, I love it. Um, it sounds like my story right now. Um, you know, they don't, they don't want to talk about where I went to undergrad. Um, uh, they don't want to talk about how I dropped out and sold beepers, uh, you know, in underserved neighborhoods like Compton. Um, <laughs> they, they, but they want to talk about how great of a writer I am and how I'm doing my MBA at the university yeah. of Chicago. So, um, did you finish uh, your college? You know, I went back, um, after six months, um, I went back, you know, it, it's just such a crazy story. So. Uh, we were selling door to door, you know, this was when before cell phones like really took over the market. So we could mm -hmm. still sell long difference this distance phone services where you pay extra to dial out of state. And the company was called Excel Communications. Um, and they were a publicly traded network marketing company. So people kind of forget. Um, so it was actually a legitimate business, but the way we were doing it was kind of sneaky because we were, you know, selling it to, um, you know, people that needed to save five dollars on their phone bill. And what ended up happening was um, after I signed up all these, you know, dorm mates and, you know, classmates and stuff like that, um, someone put gasoline on my car and then burnt it to the ground while I was on a business trip and had my car parked um, at my parents' house. So my dad saw the car literally melt. And if you go to my um, parents' parking, uh, air, uh, you know, <laughs> our, um, our street, it's like you still, you still see the burnt rubber uh, tire marks on the ground. I think it was probably your mom. <laughs> and at first we were just like, oh my God, you know, like Kevin sold some beepers to Crips and Bloods or something in Compton. Um, she's but like, it was a random act of violence. Of What's that? She's like, I'll fix this van living of his. Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, it, it turns out it was a random act of violence. Some crazy kid burnt five of the cars down. Wow. Um, mine just happened to be one of them. Um, but I saw like for the first time how upset my parents were and you know, I, I felt like okay I'm, I'm good at sales. I could probably sell a better product in the future. Um, uh, that's more, you know current um, and So then that's when I said well, okay, let's let's study a little bit, you know get some technical skills in so I did ended up um, I was it was only a seven or uh, six month fling from um, being out of school, but then I went back and then I graduated uh, quite quickly cool I never, I never, I, my parents were poor. Uh, and, uh, so I had a Pell grant that I had obtained, um, uh, thanks to my parents being poor. And, uh, over the summer before school, I'd signed up for school at the university of Utah and bought the books or I was supposed to buy the books and all. I, I paid for the classes, I guess. And, uh, and there was some money left over there for, I guess, for books or something. Um, and I, so I signed up and in the meantime, I lost my job at McDonald's because I had long hair and one of the uh, cult members uh, felt that I was a satanic child, which I kind of was probably. Uh, <laughs> it was heavy metal. And Van Halen is so evil. Um, and uh, the uh, backward satanic messages on Led Zeppelin albums, uh, that whole thing. So I got fired and my dad said, why don't you just go do this subcontracting business that you've always helped me with since you're a kid over the summers. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I went and did it, and that gave me my first bite of being an entrepreneur. And I canceled the school, gave them back their money, and uh, and I never looked back. Never finished college. And uh, looking at me, you can probably figure that out. 
uh, at least you had the guts to to uh, not go back. See, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a chicken, so I went back. No, and, I, I, and it's probably good. It probably made your tiger mom happy. So yeah, but, that's you get her off my back. Yeah, I mean, I know I know PhD people, and they're really education is really important to them. In fact, it's very circular in their in their uh, their understanding of life, wheel hub of everything. And I can't blame them. You can make a lot of money if you have a PhD and you go on the circuit of, of the uh, colleges and stuff and it gives you a really good college speaking tour and in and, and of course once you say you have a phd everybody goes well he must know a lot about that and nothing else oh <laughs> well it, it is true um you know to you know for a lot of people so you know, sure. i don't disagree with you yeah so i mean phd is important there's you know, I, I used to think that everyone was like me, and I still think everyone's pretty much like me. I don't think I'm any sort of special person, although there are some people on the internet that do call me a very special person. I think that's different than what I'm thinking about, although sometimes I do wonder. Um, but uh, I pretty much, you know, what people told me is that I seem to be a sort, sort of person who can resolve things, who can problem solve, who can vision, who can innovate, <clears throat> who can think like what you have put into your book outside the box. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because I'm superiorly lazy, which I am. <laughs> you know, I mean, to me, I, I watch baseball and I see the guys running around the bases. And I'm like, why are you doing that, that roundabout thing when you could just go to second base and come back in a straight line? That seems a whole lot. <laughs> it seems like way more work than we need to do Benedict. for this exercise. Just go to second base, come back. You know, have a fist fight with the pitcher in the middle or something, or try and run around him. That's <laughs> that would be entertaining. I'd watch that. You know, you gotta you gotta somehow juke the juke around the pitcher when you're going for first. <laughs> that would be entertaining. This whole going around the base crap and whatever. It's just too much work, man. Yeah. So I, I don't know if it's because I'm lazy. I uh, you know they do say a lot of CEOs and people that are successful entrepreneurs. The reason they are is because they're lazy and no one else will work for them, work with them, or can work, or they can't work for anyone else. Like I, I, just, I do not play well with others. I do not work good in a in a corporate <laughs> environment, and I just get fired like all the time because <laughs> I've got a big mouth and I say what I think. And yeah, I just I just be out the door all the time. In fact, most companies that I worked for before I became an entrepreneur, I usually was either fired, laid off, and usually. My big mouth wasn't helping at all. Well, you know, that's, I mean, that's great. I mean, I think, you know, I actually talk about this in my book. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, the America was built off of nonconformists, you know, mm -hmm. the banner is being the crap out of the British. Um, and what I love about what I under, you know, coming in um, to America and moving back and forth, it really made me understand the American dream, like in the eyes of both a foreigner and as a native, the way I describe in my book. So one of the first things um, when I was growing up in Korea, like kids make fun of you calling you a retard, a coward, blah, blah, blah. It's all about intellectualism. Uh, and in, in Minnesota, when I was growing up, the worst thing you can get called was a chicken, right? A scaredy cat, right? <laughs> so it was all about courage. Yeah. So, so, you know, we call this country the home of the brave. Um, so I talk about this in my book where I had to almost re-engineer the way I think to be successful. And I think sometimes... Um, you know, nowadays, you know, everyone wants to do their own little tech startup and, and whatnot, building these app, like, you know, the hundredth dating app or subscription. App or whatnot. I, I get it. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of I think we're kind of forgetting um, what made us so successful as a country, too. And that's, you know, I kind of touched upon that in my book. But, um, you know, we, we you know, you're 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 support. You're you're the, you're the type of person um, that's supposed to represent our values. So that's that's good. I don't see it as a bad thing. I don't know this. It depends on which girlfriend of mine you ask. I might not represent all of America's values. America. It must be kind of challenging to move to Minnesota. Uh, I don't know if it was a rural part of Minnesota or the uh, city part. Um, we were in Twin Cities, so St. Paul for a little bit, and then we moved to a small yeah. town, uh, New Brighton. Uh, yeah. North. Yeah. One of the things that shaped me is I grew up in SoCal, and we, my mom was really wonderful. She'd take us to the beach. We had one of those camper VWs so she could cook some baked beans and we could we could change in the camper and then we'd go play in the sun all day at the beach and then go sleep in the camper and she'd drive. You know, it was just a wonderful life. We go to Disneyland all the time. Of course, you have the local discount um, and you live in the sun. And 
uh, you know, we the first few years of my life, we lived in Beverly Hills. My parents were rich, but they managed this apartment complex uh, on the same block as as uh, um, uh, Monty Hall from uh, from uh, the uh, game show. And so we grew up walking the dog with Monty Hall as a kid. I used to always sit and look at him and go, how does he get in that TV? And he's like, how does, he, how does he do that? And I lived in a world in Beverly Hills, just two blocks from the the what used to be the Man Theater. It's now the Kodak Theater. And I don't know, I think they filed bankruptcy again. Um, but uh, we have two blocks from that. So my whole world was BMWs, Mercedes, and Rolls Royces in the 60s and, and early 70s. And so to me, that was normal. Like everyone drives you know, Mercedes. And then <clears throat> in my late teens, we moved to Utah. And it was literally, we moved literally to American Fork, Utah, which is where they filmed the movie Flashdance. Uh, I believe it's Flashdance. And it, and it's really the same scenes and scenario. The Lehigh Roller Mills is down the block uh, that you see in the movie uh, that, that Kevin Bacon works at. And uh, I think it was Flashdance. Isn't Flashdance the one where he goes to that city and, you know, he goes, he comes from Jersey and like everybody has dance and he can't sing and can't rock and roll. Dancing is, is of the devil. And so it was this, <laughs> I moved the same damn city. And, you know, suddenly I'm in this environment where it's cold and people are, you know, like, ugh. Or you, or you like pickup trucks. What kind of pickup truck do you like? And wow. Like, pickup trucks. What's so different? Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I like BMW and Mercedes and, and Rolls Royces. And they're like, where are you from? So huh. I don't know if you got some of that when you moved to Minnesota, but it might have been interesting, I suppose. Yeah, it was it was interesting. I mean, I remember the first comment um, when um, after I moved from Minnesota to Korea, I asked my mom like, "Why does everyone have black hair and black eyes? It's so weird." <laughs> um, I was so confused. Um, and you know, I that I think that was the most confusing part. Um, so when I was in Minnesota, I was uh, you know I was there two to nine. Um, I wasn't the only Asian kid. There was like two or three others, but um, I was definitely not very academic. I I love to you know fish. Um, swim, run around, uh, barefoot, shirt off, that kind of play baseball all the time. Um, that's all I did. And then in Korea, it was all about study, 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 study. I'm like, yeah. why, 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 why should I do this? I don't want to be a nerd. Um, and, and my, my friends in third grade said, would say, I want to go to Harvard in, in Korea. Like, how about you know? <laughs> and for me, I'm like, what's, what's how about And then they're like, Harvard, you're from America, right? Yeah, but what's Harvard? Like, I, I didn't even hear what Harvard, I didn't know what Harvard was until I went to Korea and these third graders are studying their ass off. Wow. Hoping they can get in America. So I was, I was lost. I was, so that's, that's kind of like, you know, and you can tell I'm kind of like really dark for a Korean. So that's why I use the black sheep too. It has, uh, you know, it's, it's all symbolic as well. Um, I was trying to, I was trying to, I was trying to fit in all the time my whole life. So. Um, you know, it kind of, uh, that's kind of how shaped my, my view on a lot of things. Do Asians uh, have like a, uh, do, do Asians have like a skin color sort of thing? Like black people have a thing where if you're a light skinned black person or you're a darker skinned black person, there's kind of like their own internal racism against the, <laughs> that they have in their own thing. And you're just like, Whoa, I thought, I didn't know it was just, you know, do they have that well, too? I mean, it's it's, you know, so what's really fascinating is that if you look at Korea, um, first of all, it's the second most homogenous country in the world after North Korea. Hmm. So there's no such thing as racism because there's like, what, seven Chinese people yeah. like in the 90s, right? <laughs> if you look at nowadays, I mean, there's a lot of foreigners doing business, but, you know, in the late 90s, Korea was still um, up and coming and no one yeah. wanted to go there during the IMF crisis. Um, yeah. The second part is. Korean is one of those rare civilizations that never fought with a Western civilization or have been conquered by a Western civilization ever. Hmm. So we had until the Korean War, we didn't really have interactions with white people or Africans or anyone else. But besides the Japanese and the Chinese, you guys um, are kind of white, really. <laughs> you guys are Caucasian white, but you guys are white. We are generally. So, so when it comes to you know, like racism, skin color, um, you, you know, they joke about it, but I mean, they don't really, it's not really embedded 
and no. the doesn't really mean anything. I was just wondering because you mentioned how your skin was darker than other Asians, and I wasn't sure. Yeah, you know, it doesn't really attract many Korean women. I'll tell you that. Oh, so there is kind of a bias. Well, then. in terms of beauty standards, but not like oh, you know, he's he's dark skin. You know, he's gonna you yeah. know steal a bike. You know that. Kind My of problem thing. is everybody looks the same to me, whether Asian or black. Oh no, I'm just kidding. That was horrible. Um, <laughs> I just had to pull that joke. And I'm sure it's the same way for them, too. You, you probably look at us and go, like, y'all look like a bunch of backwoods tweebs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Are. Yeah, after a few drinks. I don't Man, know. It <sighs> doesn't help I have this hat on. I just look about as white <laughs> trash as I possibly can right now. Um, so let's get back to your book. You know, you talk about thinking about out of the box. <clears throat> One of the things that really shaped me, uh, and I remember – it was really shocking to me at the time and it, it, it made me realize and it was a uh, um it was a gentleman by the name of lewis oh i want to say tome lewis thome thune anyway i have to look it up but years ago i i had gone to work at a car dealership i'd worked for a leasing auto company and then they went out of business because they were uh they were flowing money and not paying the bills and so I was kind of I kind of ended the the auto business and went to work for an auto dealer after that since I knew autos and <clears throat> they sent me to a seminar with this gentleman uh, that I can't remember his name uh, but they did this really cool experiment on how to think out of the box or a uh, way to teach it uh, if you will and they took nine dots and built a square so if you think of uh, nine dots there's three going down one side, three going across the top, three going across the bottom, three across the middle if you were diagonally like a tic-tac-toe. And the guy says, he goes, I want you to do this, and I'll see if I can remember this rightly, so forgive me if I louse it up. But he goes, I want you to connect all the nine dots in the box without lifting your pen, and you can only draw four lines, if I recall rightly. Mm. So you can only draw four lines connecting nine dots. And so everyone's tried to do it. And they're like, we can't do it. I don't, you know, there's, there's some secret to it. And everyone's trying to draw within the dots on the box four lines. They have to be straight and you cannot lift your pen. So they have to be straight lines. I think I skipped that part. And you got to connect them all. <clears throat> so it's impossible to do. So he showed us how to do it. And of course, you take the first stroke of your pen down the long side of any of the sides, but you extend another dot beyond the box. And then you cross over and in, and, and I think you go over and then you do another crossover. But in both cases, I believe you go outside the box. At least you go outside the box at least once, if not twice. I think, I think it's just once you go outside the box. But the key principle is the thing you learn from the exercise is that you learn to think outside of the box and people see the box and yeah. they they immediately create this confine of the box that this is the area of space that i have to deal with and what you learn probably what's in your book and probably what you learn as an entrepreneur is that that box doesn't have all the answers and sometimes you have to think outside the box hence the hence the term probably i don't know where it originates from but uh, the exercise is a great exercise and that really blew my mind when I saw it. And I, I realized the scotoma that I had built in my mind, that everyone else had built in their mind that was in the room with us for the lesson, that we'd all built the scotoma, that this was the reality, this was the truth, the, the rules of this box. And there wasn't any lines. It, it was just a series of dots. Mm -hmm. So the box was fairly open-ended, but we created the lines around the box that entrapped us and encompassed and kept us from getting outside the box and of course resolving the issue we had so i thought that was a really interesting thing in fact i've done a couple of videos teaching that same lesson like it was taught to me and uh a really powerful experience in learning to see outside the box and out of that from an entrepreneur i actually learned something else you can always improve something everything can always be improved exponentially I don't know what it is. I don't know how to make it to the next level, but that's what you have to find out as an entrepreneur. Everything can be improved. Even if you improve something, there is another step you can go to. You just have to find it, and you have to get out of that box of thinking of where is that space and where can it actually grow and become. Mm. I wish I knew that story. It would have been in one of my chapters. You could show it to your mom. You could say, hey, mom. 
do the box. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'll see you at dinner tonight, so maybe I'll get yeah, that. Yeah, you should be like, yeah, just – and never tell him the answer. Just be like, I'll tell you what, you can call me a bad son when you can connect all the <laughs> – it's a pretty interesting experiment. I wish I had like a pen here just to draw it, but I, I'm sure people Google it, think outside the box uh, uh, experiment or something like that. You'll see it. It's basically a square of, of nine – uh, is it nine dots, three across, three in the middle, three in the bottom? Yeah. And it, it look, kind of looks like a little tat, uh, tic-tac-toe, if you will, sort of uh, box, but it doesn't have lines in the middle. And you literally have to connect all the dots with a straight line, only drawing straight, only drawing straight lines. So you can draw four straight lines, but you can't curve. And uh, the only way to do it is you extend one of the lines outside the box at least once, if not twice. Um and you thereby connect all the dots. In fact, I think you go out uh, down the one side and you come out and I think you cross over the top and then you go over and then you go up the middle. Anyway, I'm sure people can find it online. That's what Google's for. Yeah. So uh, there you have it. <laughs> so your book is a great way to think outside the box, how to be a nonconformist. You're probably better, I think you probably found it being an entrepreneur, correct? Then... Than being a student, oh yeah. Then and being then working for someone else. Oh yeah. Um. So I mean, it's it's tough working for someone else because of the company politics. I find that very frustrating. Um. And I didn't really realize this until you know I left Geoflex and then got that corporate uh, gig at a uh, Cinema Intelligence because you'll see all the middle managers. They'll just talk to you, you know, like normally, and then and then when the big boss comes in, they just all perk up. You know, um, talk differently. They're, they're all of a sudden they're so agreeable, um, and I just like what? Why? Why are you so scared? Um, why are you so you know like why why just, why can't you just say how you feel like? So I remember um, you know my first week. Uh, so I was the chief sales officer. We had a CEO and then we had a product manager. And then if they're telling me what to do in sales, I'm like, dude, I'm really. I mean, I made ten thousand dollars a month not being able to speak English doing network marketing. And then I built my previous startup to a $15 million valuation, signing up almost every single movie theater. And they're telling me what to do. And I said, shut the door, right? <laughs> like, shut the door. And I started yelling at my CEO and I started yelling um, at my product manager. You know, basically, they don't know what to do. I mean, I guess most middle managers and directors wouldn't even think of that. So I saw my product manager, her draw, jaw just drops like, and she's trying to like, no, 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 that's not what Kevin means. No, that's exactly what I mean. Um, a week later, uh, you know, my CEO, he, 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 he and I bump into one of um, one of the reporters that covered me during my man van days. And the reporter has a mic up. And he's like, so what's it like to work with Kevin? And he goes, it's actually really intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I, felt, I felt so bad because, I mean, he knew I was a value add and, you know, I could add a lot to the company, but I wasn't trying to like, put them down or anything. I just say what I need to say. Um, and yeah, sometimes that really gets me into trouble. Um, but it sure is really efficient. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard when you work for a company and, and, uh, you know, I've, I started out being an entrepreneur uh, at companies I was with before I left. And so I would always have all these ideas and that's what really seated me at being an entrepreneur is because I'd have ideas. I'd look at stuff and go, why the hell do we do it that way? Why? And people go, well, that's the way we've always done it. And you're like, but why do we do it this way? This is, it's logically stupid, but that's the way everyone's always done it. And we did it before that. Um, it's kind of like, uh, do you, have you ever heard the story of the uh, young wife who gets married in the Turkey, you know, the Thanksgiving Turkey story? You ever heard that? No. So I'll tell it for people because uh, it probably fits into your book and maybe you can use it for the next book. And I don't own the rights to it anyway. So, this, this guy marries his young wife and he marries her and um, they get to Thanksgiving dinner and she's preparing the turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. She tears off the legs or cuts off the legs of the turkey and throws them in the trash. And she puts turkey, you know, what's left of the turkey in the oven and starts cooking it. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just, you just <laughs> threw away some of the best, my favorite parts of the turkey. Oh, what are you doing? And she goes, well, that was the way my mom taught me to do it. And I've always done it that way. And she's always done it that way as we raised. And he said, well, why does she do it that way? And the wife says, I don't know. Let's call her up and find out. 
So they call up the mom and they go, hey, mom, why did you teach me and why all of our life did you always cut the legs off the turkey before you put it in the oven from away? And she goes, I don't know. My grandmother always did it that way. So they go, well, let's call up the grandmother and find out why, the, why this generational thing of teaching has been, you know, we cut off the legs of the turkey. So they call up the grandmother. Grandma's like, I don't know, great grandmother always, always, uh, always did that. So thankfully their great grandmother was alive. So they call her up and they call up great grandmother and they say, hey, great grandmother, why, why did you teach four generations of us to cut off the legs of the turkey, throw it away and put it in the oven? And she's like, well, that's because back in the, you know, the 1800s when I grew up, we just had really small ovens. So there was no way to cook whole turkeys in the oven. So we just did that. <laughs> so for four generations of family, they had taught everyone and everyone just went, well, we've always done it that way. So, and no one had questioned it until this, uh, until someone four generations later did. And a lot of that happens in companies, you know, people do stuff. I, you know, I remember going to work for a company and you're like, why do we do it this way? This seems really stupid. And they go, I don't know. They've always done it. You know, it's the same problem I have with baseball where I'm just like, why do we have to run around on the bases? Just like run up and punch the pitcher and run back. And it's like boxing with, you know, hit him with the bat. I don't care. Uh, you know, that, that actually sounds more interesting than baseball. Um, I think most people would agree with me, considering football is a violent sport and more interesting than baseball when it goes on. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's the big challenge. But when you're an entrepreneur, you, you have to – you learn to challenge those things. And because you are the boss and the buck stops with you, you have the power to go, hey, we should probably look at that. You know, or meanwhile, if you work at a corporation, you're like – well, there are certain rules that we have against people changing the rules, so you can't really mess with the rules. Just do what you're told and and uh, walk through the assembly line of life, and you know maybe hopefully you'll get a gold watch at the end. <laughs> so yeah, no, I I agree. I mean, it's you know very much like that, and um, for certain, I mean, I it's it's so funny because certain people are just really bad corporate people, but they're amazing entrepreneurs, and uh, yeah. vice versa. Some people are just really bad. Um, and and there really are, and there's something wrong with being that employee that uh, is very comfortable being employed and living that whole life. Um, it, there's something wrong with that. I mean, I've I, I had a great business partnership years ago with a great friend of mine for about 22 years and 13 years as a business partner, and him and I were uh, kind of polar opposites uh, when it came to the functionality of what we do. I was a great visionary and an entrepreneur, and and uh, you know, if if you gave me a yellow pad and I said, okay, we're gonna think outside the box and we're gonna come up with all these innovations you know i i could fill you know a tablet uh meanwhile if you gave him something of a tablet which i did on a regular basis said please come up with some ideas he'd come back with an empty um but he was really good at doing the menial work the repetition work like accounting and and bookkeeping and things and that sort of work would drive me insane but he was really good at it. He was really good at the employee sort of work, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, when he left the company, because uh, he got sick of being an entrepreneur and all the challenge of it, um, I replaced him with like a $2,500 a month secretary who could do the data work because what he was doing was so simple. Um, and, you know, so th th there's, there's, uh, there's, there's places for everybody, I guess, in this world. I think the biggest challenge is like, you know, people that are probably exploring and reading your book are going to need to find out is, am I that entrepreneur person and how do I get there at being successful in my business? Or am I the person who um, is pretty good at just moving widgets back and forth on a table in a, in a job, in a J-O-B? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I respect someone so much more mm -hmm. that really understands themselves and just like, hey, you know, sometimes it's really hard to admit that, hey, I'm just not this type of person, um, but I could be a really good corporate accountant, you know, or um, a lawyer or whatever, right? So some people are just better, you know, kind of being that role player type of person uh, within a corporation. And some of these roles, I mean, they, they you know, you get, get you can get paid six figures, um, even like, you know, if you're good at coding, like a programmer or, you know, really good digital marketer. Um, and you don't have to worry about, uh, being a risk taker because you know um a couple co-founders that i've worked with they just couldn't sleep you know at night if our ticket sales went down or if you didn't raise enough funding um if a uh, manager was quitting 
um, you know, they're just constantly losing sleep and it's just so much risk for them. And, you know, it's not really about who's more talented or not. It's just sometimes about just risk talent tolerance. Yeah. And some people just have different personalities. I've met people that wanted to be entrepreneurs and I'm like, with your personality, you just don't, they were very PhD, PhD ish, very book minded people. Uh, one was a math teacher and I just said, look, you, you got, I can tell by you, the way that you operate, unless you read it in a book or, or teach it out of a book, you can't, you can't get out of the box and you're not going to do well as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it can be challenging that way. And so I think you just need to find where your place is in life, and what you're good at, and then expand on it. And I, I, it's really hard to be an entrepreneur. You know, what you were saying earlier about, you know, some people can do it, some people can't. The thing about an entrepreneur is you live it 24-7. I used to dream business. I would dream at night about all the stuff I needed to do the next morning. I would dream about the meetings I would need to have. Like, I remember I went for years and I remember thinking, can I just have a dream about like a hot chick for once running through a field? <laughs> like, just why do I have to dream about business? And and I think I was always so worried about, you know, different stuff I had to do, messes I had to clean up the next day, uh, people I either needed to fire the next day, you know. And I, and I would literally have dreams about what it was like. And where when you work for somebody else, it's really nice. You can go home at five o'clock and you can hang up your business hat. You don't have to think about the company anymore until you go in at 9 a.m. the next morning. And so it's it's definitely challenging uh, for people to be an entrepreneur. And, and uh, you know, you're always on the on the on the high wire. Right. 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 You know, so so I mean, you know, in my book, I do mention it again, because like sometimes even if you are an entrepreneur at heart, if there's no idea that you're passionate about, don't force yourself to be an entrepreneur just because you are an entrepreneur. You know, so like, for example, my my thing right now is, is that I'm advising startups um, and people just pay me good money to just give advice. And I work, you know, just 20 hours a month. Um, you know, I'm working on my MBA. Um, it's a good time, but it would be kind of even though I have probably the entrepreneurial skill set and attitude. Um, because I don't have a particular problem I want to fix, I'm not just jumping in and say, hey, you know, 24-7, I got to be this entrepreneur. So, um, you know, there's, it's always, you know, timing, um, you know, you have to be comfortable with it. Um, you have to be in the right situation, the right mindset um, as well, you know, when you're thinking about your next business idea. So I, I really harp on that in my book as well. Sounds good. So everyone check out his book. You can get it on Amazon.com, The Outlier Approach, How to Triumph in Your Career as a nonconformist, I'd highly recommend it. Sounds like we have sort of the same sort of experiences. Uh, some of the key points, I'll just read off the page here. Uh, flip your weaknesses into strength. Learn the tricks, tricks of trading social value to build powerful connections in any industry. Master the art of selling vision to anyone. Vision is super important of being a CEO or being an entrepreneur. Uh, you have to sell vision to your investors, your employees, your vendors. You constantly are selling vision 24 seven. Re-engineer your reality by redefining your expectations, real life examples and stories along with actionable items and unleash the non-conformist inside of you and practical tactics, real stories to help you make breakthroughs in your career. So wonderful book you can find on amazon.com. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you, uh, Kevin. What other uh, places can we find you on the interwebs? Um, I'm pretty big on LinkedIn. Cool. And um, you can always ask me a question on Quora. I've been asking um, a lot of readers and potential readers um, questions that they've been asking me. That's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, my Twitter is kind of growing. And um, pretty soon I'm, my uh, Forbes column is going to start uh, going because I just moved from Inc. to Forbes uh, earlier this month. So that's going to nice. be exciting. Yeah. Nice. That's, Forbes is a great place to write. And I've had a lot of friends that have written for Forbes. I have some friends that have written for Inc. or do write for Inc. And uh, yeah, that's a great place too. I really should write for Inc, but I, I'm not sure that I have the. I just uh, I've written for several different magazines, and they're always bugging me at the last minute to get articles to. And I'm like, I'm, I'm getting it. Get <laughs> it yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. I I'm better it. at I'm better at talking than writing. That hence why we do this uh, on video and audio on the uh, podcast. So okay, I think I'm, I'm more sure that I'm better at it, but I'm just better at writing than <laughs> talking than writing. So. There's that.
Cool. Thanks, Chris. Really. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, tuning in. Thanks to Kevin for being on the show. Be sure to check out his book. We love you guys as an audience, especially those of you who listen this far. You get a special star on your forehead if you stuck with us throughout this whole thing. And of course, you learn all the best stuff. The more, the longer the podcast goes, the better stories seem to go as well. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification button. Be sure to get those notifications. Tell your friends, neighbors, relatives, dogs, cats, uh, pool boys, uh, cousins, third cousins, you know, maybe cousins you date in Alabama. Get them to listen to the Chris Voss Show and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and being an excellent audience, as you are always. Thanks to Kevin. We'll see you guys next time.